We're here today to discuss the outlook for financial regulation, 10 years on from the financial crisis, what is working in the Dodd-Frank reforms and in Basel III, what should change and what will change in the coming years. And uh, this morning, in this morning's session, we got a little bit of news on this from Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, um, who requested a thank you for the uh, rise in bank stock prices uh, since Donald Trump's election, said you should thank him personally for that. And I, I actually, I want to open the panel discussing that a little bit. Um, there's been this great run-up in stock prices since November 8th, especially in the financial sector, something like a 20% increase. And so, to Mnuchin's point, why are bank stocks up so much? Is this, is this about expectations of changes in regulation under President Trump? Is that a warranted expectation? Um, and if it is warranted, will the changes from bank regulation change be felt positively in the economy more broadly, or will they just be felt as higher bank profits that could even come at a cost of greater risk and instability in the system? So do we owe Secretary Mnuchin a thank you? Um, let's, uh, uh, let me introduce the panel, and then uh, we have uh, Patrick Cronin is CEO of BMO Capital Markets, where he oversees BMO Financials Group's interactions with corporate, government, and institutional <laughs> clients. Robert Lavitt is the general counsel for SoFi, which is an online non-bank lender. Uh, Barbara Novick is vice chairman of BlackRock, where she leads the firm's efforts globally on government relations and public policy. Mike Summers is the president and CEO of the American Investment Council, which is an industry group for the private investment industry. Uh, he was previously chief of staff to House Speaker John Boehner. And Neil Wolin uh, is counselor at Brunswick, and he previously served as deputy secretary of the Treasury during the Obama administration um, under both Tim Geithner and Jack Lew. Um, so, Mike, why don't I start with you? What, what are investors so enthusiastic about here, and do they have reason to be so enthusiastic? Thank you, and thanks for, thanks for uh, coming to the session today. I know it's a beautiful day outside, and a lot of you probably wanted to have class outside uh, given the <laughs> weather. Um, so look, I mean, I, I think you know, one thing to help put this into perspective, you know, I've been asked a lot about the president's first 100 days. And the standard response that I've given is that the first 100 days are a lot like an ambulance in midtown Manhattan during rush hour. There's a lot of noise and a lot of lights, but not a lot of movement. On the regulatory side, I do think it's a lot different. Uh, I think that, that uh, this administration has uh, really put an effort into doing some significant you know, regulatory reform uh, it, within that first 100 days. And unlike um, what I would expect uh, with uh, financial deregulation, they, they've actually had some significant success on the regulatory side with the Congressional Review Act resolutions, that 13 of which have actually been signed into law. All of those, however, have been uh, on kind of the non-financial sector side. So there's really two ways to look at this. There's the financial deregulation and the deregulation that's occurring uh, within other sectors of the economy. So I think as we look at this panel, I think what we really have to think about are what are the, what are the big things that, that can happen on the, on the financial deregulatory side. A lot of those things actually are going to have to go through the same legislative process that those CRAs have gone through. Uh, and it's a, it's a very difficult gauntlet to get through. So Chairman Henseling on the House side, for example, has just put through, uh, is trying to put through his Financial Choice Act to replace Dodd-Frank. I don't think it's any secret at this point that that's going to be a very, very difficult thing to do. Uh, it doesn't have much of a chance in the United States Senate of passing. Um, but I do think that Chairman Henseling uh, will try to do some one-off pieces of legislation uh, to try to get uh, some, of those, some of those issues enacted into law. But it's a very, very difficult process, I think, from the legislative side where to, to see significant financial deregulation going through. But the other side of this is what they can do on the, on the regulatory side without uh, legislation. And that's why I think what you've seen so far, which is this, uh, a White House and an administration that's been very slow to get their personnel uh, into place, uh, that significantly pushes back any significant uh, uh, deregul deregulatory measure. Um, I, I think that most of us understand that personnel is policy, and they simply do not have the personnel at this point. So I think those are two big factors that we need to uh, view this through. One, the legislative side, and two, uh, the fact that they just don't have the personnel in place at this point to, to do any of the big deregulatory stuff that they want to do. So that sort of sounds like it adds up to probably not that much change and, and less change than a lot of people are, are acting like. Is I, I would say that there is a lot of irrational exuberance right now in terms <laughs> of, of how uh, deregulatory on the financial side is going to play out. Uh, Neil, why don't, why don't you take us through sort of how we got 
where we are today. You were around as a lot of this regulatory framework was, was getting put in place. How, how well, did, grade yourself, how well did you guys do? Um, and uh, wh how did we end up where we are? Thank you, Josh. You know, I, I think it's important um, that we not sort of fall into a bit of collective amnesia about what uh, happened in 07 and 08 and 09 uh, that brought us to Dodd-Frank and a set of regulatory adjustments. So, you know, we got to government in January 2009. The financial markets were seized up, uh, financial institutions of a wide range of uh, descriptions were failing. The real economy shed almost 900,000 jobs in that month, January 09 alone. And so I think it's important when we think about what the right regulatory framework is to remember those moments. Uh, the idea that the framework that we had before was manifestly inadequate. And um, although the, the causes of the financial crisis were, I think, decidedly uh, multiple, one key piece, I think, was a financial regulatory framework that was not uh, modern as it needed to be. It didn't include uh, big chunks of the financial sector, derivatives, shadow banking, um, capital held by banks was inadequate. There wasn't enough consumer protection. There wasn't a way for the government to avoid the, <coughs> the really quite unpleasant choice of either using taxpayer money to bail out a firm on the one hand, a non-bank, these are for non-banks, or letting it fail kind of uh, very destructively on the other. And so I think um, super important for us to remember that and to have that be the gauge of how we think about what we need and what's right going forward. I would say, as I sit here today, it feels to me like our financial services sector is much more stable, our framework, our regulatory framework much stronger, uh, banks much better capitalized, derivatives now um, not opaque, brought within the regulatory ambit a capability for the government to deal with non big non-bank financial institutions that suffer huge amounts of stress in ways that don't bring all kinds of knock-on effects to the rest of the financial sector, a consumer protection function that is focused and that deals with, I think, another uh, one of the multifactorial causes of the financial crisis, sort of consumers buying products they didn't understand, couldn't afford, um, and so forth. And so I think we're in a much better place uh, than we were. That's not to say, uh, and this is really my third point, that's not to say that we shouldn't take a look at what we put in place and constantly think about what adjustments are appropriate. Uh, we should be looking at these rules both individually and in the aggregate to see what their effects are to make sure we understand whether they've uh, done as was intended or rather maybe not so much, uh, whether the set of rules or any one of the rules uh, causes a, a fair amount of, of, um, of pain for financial institutions without much upside. Those are things that we should be asking ourselves. And I think there are a range of areas where it's worth specifically taking a look, whether, um, for example, small banks ought to be given um, more relief relative to all of the prudential standards that have been applied to the biggest banks, whether the Volcker rule should be clarified and simplified, whether um, uh, end users of derivatives are able to use derivatives in ways that uh, contribute to risk mitigation or whether there are rules that get in the way of that, and you know, whether the financial regulatory structure itself should be simplified, a very hard thing to do politically, but the fact that we have two market regulators in the US, an SEC and a CFTC, which is globally unique and can't be right from a from the perspective of substance, whether that can be revisited, notwithstanding uh, jurisdictional rules in Congress that have caused that to persist for this long. So I think, in general, um, we're in a much, much better place than we were in 2008, 2009. The financial sector's in a better place. The government's more capable of understanding what's going on and more able to react when it sees things that give them concern. Uh, but there are, of course, a range of areas, I just suggested some, but there are others uh, where we should be looking to see whether we can do better still. Uh, Barbara, when we, when we spoke before the conference, I have in my notes that you described a, a tsunami of regulation facing uh, 
financial institutions. And I, I guess my question is basically, how do you look at the, at the variety of regulations and sort of what, what Neil described, the various needs that they were aiming to serve and figure out, you know, it seems like most people say, well, this stuff is more complicated than it needs to be and costly to comply with. How do you figure out which are the parts that are the unnecessary parts of the tsunami and which, which ones that can be gotten rid of? Right. So I think you have to start by going back to the crisis and what really went wrong and then say, well, then what do we do about it in terms of regulation and how does that even match up? Um, and I would argue, well, this might be simplistic. Um, the crisis started with bad mortgages, um, was compounded by huge amounts of leverage, was compounded by inadequate supervision and compounded again by fraud and think Madoff as a, a great example. When you look at Dodd-Frank, Dodd-Frank alone is 2,000 pages. Um, it spawned hundreds of studies and rules by different regulators, some of them regulators on their own, some of them jointly amongst anywhere from two to five agencies. So a, a very, very complex process. Davis Polk has a um, meter that they put out of how far along we are. We're still not done even meeting the Dodd-Frank requirements. And you think about the thousands and thousands of pages, it's like the tax code. We now have the, the tax code version of financial regulation. So you, know, you sort of use that as your benchmark and you go back and you say, well, how many of those new rules lined up with the problems? It turned out everybody and their brother put in their wish list items. You, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste, so if I have something on my list that I've always wanted to have, now is the window to jump through and put that out there too. So we have lots of superfluous stuff that really had nothing to do with the crisis. Um, in addition, you know, we spawned this whole international process where, of course, we now have international groups setting standards which we then apply um, domestically. So we have to weigh that factor. What they started to do in Europe is they called it a call for evidence. Let's get people's ideas. When you look at this cumulative body of stuff, what does it mean? I would argue the system is safer, but it's also so safe we don't have growth. So we need to find something that keeps the safety and soundness, but also you know, gives us a little breathing room. Thousands and thousands of reports and you know, data items that are reported, the same data items to 10 different places or five different definitions of the same metric. It, it's just very, very wasteful and getting some uniform standards, but doing really a call for evidence, asking industry who actually lives under these rules, what do you suggest? And that doesn't mean take everything at face value, but at least what do you suggest? And uh, frankly, Secretary Mnuchin, that's what he and his team are doing. They've held, I don't know how many different round tables with different industry subsets. They've had people come in, talk to them about you know, what things are working and what things are not. And I think that's a, a different version of the call for evidence. I think it's a very healthy process. And I hope that it leads to, well, it's not in the first 100 days. I didn't expect it would be. The report's not even due till June um, from Treasury. I think they're going to have more than one report from what he said this morning. And some of it will be regulatory. Some of it will be legislative. But if you go back to Dot Frank alone spawning all these regulations, Anything that was done by regulators can be re revisited by regulators and has nothing to do with JEB and the, the Choice Act or anything like that. And the last point I would make is just on the Choice Act itself. You know, sometimes people present it as a repeal of Dodd-Frank. I don't think it's a repeal at all. I think it's a um, renegotiation of specific provisions. Some things he leaves alone. I mean, he leaves Title VII on derivatives virtually alone because clearly it was an underregulated area and something that needed work. But the CFTC chair, the new CFTC chair, says some of the rules that were put in place, he wants to change, right? You know, someone like Dan Tarolo on his, they call it now a valedictory speech, he said the Volcker rule is way too complex, okay? So he's really identified as the czar of the banking rules and regulations. And if he thinks it's too complex, you realize these things just need to be revisited with a clear head, keeping in mind safety and soundness, but then also recognizing that we're strangling um, our financial markets. Uh, Patrick, what's, what's your reaction to that? I know, that? I know that you had said before the conference that you think regulation has been directionally a good thing for the industry. Yeah, and I guess I'm probably 
maybe halfway between where, where Neil was and where Barbara is. I would certainly say for the Volcker Act, I, I would agree. Um, you know, on balance, I think the intent was was sound, um, but the execution was quite poor. Um, you know, I think there's definitely been second order impact on liquidity in the marketplace, and that's been well documented across many asset classes. Um, and then secondly, you know, I think the debate still rages about what is proprietary trading versus what is market making. Um, and then, as Barbara said, the documentary requirements are are quite onerous. And so, I think intentionally, it was it, the intent of it was right, but they came at it the wrong way. And there's other ways to get at, at the speculative risks that would occur in a trading business, primarily through different capital and liquidity treatments. But on balance, as I said earlier, I think the, the regulatory agenda post-crisis has been quite positive. And um, you know, I think this is where Neil was, was going. I think if you think about the three objectives um, of, the, of the regulatory agenda, first, that to reduce the risk of a systemic failure or a major financial firm, it's hard to argue that higher capital, particularly higher capital and liquidity rules, um, haven't made a material difference uh, in, in that process. Aspect. And then secondly, obviously we're not going to be able to guarantee there's no failure, so in the event of a failure, have we limited the, the possibility for spillover into the broader economy and into the rest of the system? And then again, I think, um, you know, when you look at things like, and again, it's not perfect, but the Financial Stability Oversight Council, um, uh, you know, the der derivative requirements for clearing corps. Clearly, we've made progress on that objective as well. And then lastly, in the event that we do have a failure, um, you know, clearly we want to reduce the risk that there's a taxpayer uh, uh, funding of, of the bailout. And I think, again, the new, d new regulation has made progress there as well. And I would point to things like CCAR. Again, not as, not as perfect as it could be and certainly onerous, but the risk discipline that that has put on institutions, uh, I think, has been directionally a really good thing. Things around contemplation of dividend policy in the event of a crisis, um, you know, equity. <laughs> stock buybacks, equity issuance, what to do around incentive compensation, you know, all of those things did not exist pre-crisis. And so I think directionally we've captured a lot of good things. Clearly that comes with a cost. And uh, so tweaking of the existing regulations to bring a reduction in certainly complexity or cost would be a good thing. Um, but I think there's also a tendency to be uh, a little bit too focused on Dodd-Frank as well. Dodd-Frank is just one part of the regulatory spectrum and um, thinking that that's going to maybe solve all of the industry's problems, certainly financially, I think is, is quite simplistic. Um, first, I think, um, you know, as, as someone else touched on, the complexity of getting it done, I think, is quite significant. So, but even if there was some whole scale change to Dot Frank, it's unlikely to make a material change to capital and liquidity requirements. And I'd argue that's been one of the biggest factors that shapes certainly the financial prospects of the industry. Um, you know, when you think about the, the impact on return on equity for the, for the sector, um, it's been primarily impacted by things like that as opposed to, to regulatory. And that's not to say that hasn't been a factor, but mm -hmm. the bigger factor has been capital and liquidity. Um, and then there's more, there's more coming. So even if we make progress on this, um, you know, MIFID II is coming, and the net stable funding ratio is coming, and fundamental review of the trading book is coming, and I think we've just started down the path of, I think, probably a wave of regulation around cybersecurity. And so this would be, it would be great to make some progress, but I think we would be naive to think that that's going to make a massive difference in the financial prospects of the industry. I, I, are the two of you in disagreement at all there? I'm, I'm having <clears throat> trouble telling. Like, do, would, despite all that, that you said there, do you think there's a lot of room to scale back parts of the regulatory framework and, and retain the things that you see as valuable there, or is, or, or is that not possible? Is it that the, the, these or, things are necessarily complicated? Oh, no, I, I absolutely think numbers. it's possible. And there's, okay. there's, and again, it's, I would put it in the category of tweaking, or maybe, you know, things like the leverage ratio, I think, is a meaningless metric that should be scrapped. I think Volcker should be repealed and replaced with something that's more simple um, and more of a bright line test. Uh, I think there's, you know, the, certainly the, a lot of the regulation around compensation is way overdone. It's to the point of micromanaging the compensation processes at institutions. So I do think there's things that can be done, but I think wholesale repeal would uh, actually be, at best, would weaken this, the, the system and, at, and worst case would be quite dangerous. Rob, you, you had bemoaned in the call sort of too many, regulars, too many regulators, too much competition among those regulators. You also noted that some of the regulation is, doesn't seem to take into account uh, current technological improvements. What do you mean by that? Well, on the technologi technological side, what I would say is through advances in technology, you have many market providers now who can provide products uh, across the country five minutes. You can go online. You can essentially be pre-qualified for a loan. However, if you look at the framework for how those entities are regulated, we have 50 states. Um, all of those rules uh, are not in harmony. Some are very outdated. 
based on uh, brick and mortar requirements. Um, that uh, and and when you look at the non banks providing these products through technology, they're really disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis banks because banks have the ability to export their interest rate across 50 states. You don't have that in the non bank scenario. Now, um, you know, on the point in terms of too many regulators, I would say also that when you look at our system, I think it's quite unique. You have the Federal Reserve, you have the FDIC, you have the OCC. Now you have a new agency, the CFPB, which doesn't have congressional appropriations um, funded through the Fed. Um, and then on top of that, you layer on the 50 states. Uh, and then I think the jurisdictional lines in some cases are blurred. And that, that so I think, you know, to be more effective regulation, the lines should be clear. You know, what is the authority of the CFPB versus some of the other um, regulators? Um, and just to go back also to some of the comments on Dodd-Frank, you know, while I agree with most of, of, of what people have said, I, I wanted to point out, I think, though, that um, Dodd-Frank has really benefited the largest banks. They've improved their position. They've improved, uh, they've increased their share of deposits. Um, I don't think you find many banks with 45 billion in assets who are really anxious to get over the 50 billion asset mark because they would get the enhanced um, supervision by the Fed at that point. And I think um, a lot of Dodd-Frank just painted with too broad of a brush. So we talked a little bit about the Volcker Rule. I think it's very hard for anyone to understand all the exemptions to the Volcker Rule. There's so, so many pages of it. Um, it's very hard to even understand what the prohibitions cover right now. Um, but should you know, smaller banks be lumped into the Volcker Rule, or should that rule be reformed to where it applies to the 500 billion plus banks? Same with the enhanced um, prudential supervision. So I think there are a lot of issues. There are a lot of you know, places where Dodd-Frank could be um, improved. I think, you know, clearly, I don't think it's realistic to think it can be repealed. And I think the other point to make is, I think financial institutions have invested millions of dollars and resources in essentially complying with Dodd-Frank. So if you threw that out and replaced it with new regulations, you could actually layer on increased cost in the system. Well, let's let's talk about the Volcker Rule, because that seems to be the, the number one example that comes up where people are dissatisfied with how the, the regulations have ended up, even to the extent they agree with the intent of the Volcker Rule, I guess. So, Neil, how, why did it end up being so complicated? Is there a simpler way to regulate prop trading, or is it just something that, that needs to be regulated and is inherently difficult to define? Well, I was uh, I sat next to Paul Volcker in the hearing on that topic uh, in the Senate Banking Committee, uh, and he had a very simple idea, which was that firms that have access to the discount window and to the public fisc shouldn't be trading uh, on a proprietary basis and putting the public fisc at risk. That ver and that's really all we said. Uh, and then Congress, uh, I would say, made it you know rather more complex than that. Um, and I think it is a rule that where the basic insight is um, a pretty sensible one, but that sort of um, metastasized into a thing that is remarkably complicated. And apart from the statutory provisions of Volcker being remarkably complicated, it, the statute gave five agencies the joint responsibility for promulgating the implementing rules. So it's just um, from the get-go, I think, really was a recipe for uh, what we ended up getting. Um, I think there are some things that could probably be unwound and simplified uh, and clarified just from a regulatory perspective. Of course, again, it would require for the moment five agencies to agree. That's not an easy feat. Um, and then there are other things that would require uh, a simplification in the statute. I mean, um, you know, various members of Congress got hold of this and, you know, uh, in the way sausage is made on Capitol Hill, um, the thing got, you know, extra provisions and more complexity and more granularity and so forth. So, I, I mean, I don't sit here with a specific uh, antidote to these concerns, but I do think that there is plenty of room, both at the regulatory level and ultimately uh, at the legislative level, for the basic insight that Volcker um, articulated and that the Congress ended up including to be a whole lot uh, a whole lot easier. Now, there are going to be judgment calls one way or the other. So, I mean, you know, so much of what is in law requires a judgment by a regulator. And, you know, the idea that there are going to be perfectly clear, fine lines, I think, is, is elusive uh, in this, like in many other contexts. 
but I think there can be a lot of improvement made from where we are at the moment. But I think this is, it gets back to the whole idea of the importance of them getting the right personnel in place and quickly. Uh, we still don't have an SEC chairman, for example. He's had a hearing. He awaits confirmation in the United States Senate. Chris Giancarlo at the CFTC hasn't even had a hearing uh, in, the, in the Senate Ag Committee. Uh, so the whole personnel process has really slowed things down. I think we may look back at the first few years of the Trump administration, and we may say that really the most important regulatory change that this president has put in, into place was getting Neil Gorsuch confirmed as the next Supreme Court justice. Because ultimately there are a number of Dodd-Frank items that are headed straight to the Supreme Court. You know, the MetLife case, for example, or CFPB, you know, and as a consequence of a new conservative majority at the Supreme Court, that could really be the most significant regulatory changes that we see as a consequence of Neil Gorsuch. But so game out how that will happen. If so, if there are, if there are court rulings and they strike down re regulations, then this sort of in this skeleton team that isn't sufficiently put together will then have to write new ones, right? Well, so, it obviously depends on, on how those court cases right. come out. But right. But to the to the extent that the court causes changes, absolutely. But so then, so then you still can't get past that. Like tr Trump, sooner or later, has to to do something on these things. Yeah. Right. And I think yeah. that there's a a, a commitment uh, at this administration with this administration for significant regulatory relief on the financial side. Well, Why are you so smiling? A, a, few <laughs> things, a few things. Your question yeah. alone is, is yeah. so revealing. So for, first thing is, um, I, I think Patrick and I are actually more in agreement than not. Yeah. You know, the capital and the liquidity requirements on banks, I'm not a bank, but looking at banks, you know, the capital and liquidity requirements seem to take care of 99% of the issues. You add on all this other stuff, the leverage rule and the Volcker rule and the this rule and the that rule, what do those incrementally get you? It's very questionable. So Volcker alone is 900 pages written by five agencies. The supervisors themselves say they don't even know how to supervise the banks under this new rule. So how, how can that make any sense, right? But now your question, uh, your, your question was, there's yeah. no one home. I don't know, I went to a meeting at Treasury, which was a call for evidence meeting. There were 20 staffers and they were taking copious notes. There's plenty of people home. There's plenty of empty seats, too, mm -hmm. that need to be filled. But they're not in the new but administration. The career staff is very busily at work under you know, some, some guidance and direction. So I think it's going to take time. It Maybe it takes longer than people in this room would like. Um, but I do think directionally that the seven principles and the executive order in terms of financial services, they're nonpartisan. I mean, nobody would read those and say that's a D list or an R list. They're just simple common sense. And if that's the test and that's the guidepost for all the regulation that's been done, I expect some will be undone because it doesn't meet that test. Neil was waving. I just wanted to add a, a couple of thoughts. I think Mike's dead right that the personnel piece is overwhelmingly important. I think that uh, what the president uh, says about financial services regulation or what Steve Mnuchin says about financial service regulation is interesting in the sense that they both have very, especially the president, outsized megaphones and the power to sort of, you know, have their voice heard. But in the end, all these rules are going to be made by independent regulators. And having sat at the Treasury for a long, long time, I know a little bit about, and I see Ed DeMarco here smiling, I know a little bit about the extent to which the Treasury Secretary has a lot of, uh, a lot of air time, but not much capacity actually to get rules to his or her liking through the process. That's going to be the remit of the SEC and the CFTC and the Fed and the OCC and the FDIC. And then uh, to the extent they matter in, in some of these contexts, they don't in the Volcker context, the CFPB. Um, and so uh, in large measure, those people aren't so much home. Uh, for the moment, as Mike has described. And those are the people, not, not Steve Mnuchin, uh, who has no statutory authority in the main for any of this, um, who are going to make decisions about what adjustments are going to be made, what simplifications are going to be made, and so forth. And then there's one last thought, which is I hear Barbara saying, and as I said on the Volcker piece, I have some sympathy, that this is enormously big, thousands of pages and da da da. But I also think it's important to remember two little factoids. One I said before, I'll say it again, which is 
we had before a financial services regulatory framework that brought the country and in large measure the world's economy to its knees. So we should be starting from the basic position that what we had was completely inadequate. It may be that growth has been less uh, robust than we would have wanted over the last eight years, but it was big time negative in 07, 08, and 09. And then, um, and I think, I think that's really an important thing. And then the second thing is, you know, the financial services industry is a complex industry. And the idea that somehow, you know, we could uh, regulate it with, uh, you know, a few pages here and a few pages there, I think is, is um, uh, unlikely to be the right answer and is unlikely, for, at least from my perspective, to have been the right answer, the right lesson uh, taken from the financial services crisis, which I think should have given all of us the sense that we needed something more, something different, something slightly more um, uh, comprehensive. Uh, Rob, I know you had a... Yeah, I just, I mean, I don't want to disagree with everything Neil says, that someone is as knowledgeable as he is, but Go didn't the it. government have some of the responsibility for the financial crisis? Absolutely. I mean, the affordable housing mandates that were expanded. Um, so I don't think it's a situation where the financial crisis was solely caused by lack of a regulatory framework. There have always been, and there have been plenty of plaintiff's lawyers, if the government regulators don't want to get in, who will seek to regulate. But. The other point I wanted to make, just to, you know, to follow up, was on the personnel. I think if you look at the really key, uh, key enforcement jobs, you know, Mr. Cordray at the CFPB, he has a term that hasn't expired. There's a lot of speculation about what would happen. Um, Mr. Watts at the uh, uh, FHFA has a term, I think, that ends next year. Um, the comptroller is still in place, um, who you know, put in place the FinTech charter. Um, his term expired, actually, but he's still a holdover. So, I think you know those are the people who just there. If you think about it, if you put in a new CFPB director, that person would drive the enforcement you know um, uh, regime of that agency, and that has a huge impact on financial institutions. So I do agree that really it is the people that are, are super important in that context. Patrick, yeah, I think I would tend to agree with Neil. I think you know it's particularly on the with respect to the complexity. Um, you know, I think part of the reason that it ended up being so complex was really driven by the industry itself. And the, out of the hundreds and hundreds of pages, many of those were created because the industry drove exceptions to the rule or wanted clarifications for every possible scenario. And that's just how the industry operates. So they can build compliance regimes that are rule-based to solve all of these things. And so we've driven a lot of that. And um, certainly, uh, it's going to be hard to untangle and replace with, with something else. Um, and then the other thing that's happened is, uh, you know, I think a lot of the activity that's now been prohibited particularly under Volcker has, just, Volcker, has just moved somewhere else. So a lot of the activity has just moved into, and maybe you could argue that they're not, uh, that they aren't going to be on the public dime if those things go, but you know, some of them are growing to size that you would consider to be potentially systemic. And so we may just be transferring through Dodd-Frank one mm -hmm. problem for another. Uh, I, I wrote down uh, something Barbara said, which is that we've, we've gotten so safe we don't have growth. And so I, this this sounds like a specific claim about the what what what, what is that means that there are you know, f economically useful activities that that are therefore not being done by the industry because they are too costly under the regulatory regime. Well, I think yeah. One of the questions I would raise is opportunity cost. If you are spending millions of dollars and millions of man hours developing new compliance systems and new reporting stru you know structures and new, new um, you know, technology to deal with all that, that means you're not doing something else, mm -hmm. right? So you have an opportunity cost question which permeates the entire financial services sector, from large institutions down to small, banks, non-banks, everyone is touched by that. And it is, I mean, I like to say compliance is a growth industry, but what does compliance create? So again, don't take me wrong. I mean, I might sound like you know so, some extremist. I don't think we didn't need fixing. I think we needed fixing, but I think we threw a lot of things into that sink, and you know, as a wish list of, of people's items that really had nothing to do with the crisis, and we complicated it unnecessarily. And I think we can undo some of that. We can harmonize some of the reporting across different agencies. We can do ourselves a big favor by simplifying and making things proportional to the issues on, on the table. Um, but I wouldn't take it all away. I wouldn't even come close to that. I, I guess the question I have there then is that, that you know, the, 
there are certain regulations that you can put on financial institutions that will call, that will reduce growth over some period. And the question you don't know is, is that just harmful loss of growth or is that because you prohibited activities that would have created risks and unsoundness in, in the down cycle? So I guess how do we, how do we know which is which right now? I mean, I guess, uh, I, mean, I think the statement is true for small banks, and there's lots of evidence there to show that, um, you know, the, there's, the regulatory burden is really onerous on them. Um, but I think, I haven't, I wouldn't say that that's true for large banks. And in fact, when you look at CNI growth, um, you know, it's other than till very recently, there's been a substantial amount of growth. And, um, you know, there's certainly been, and that at very cheap, cheap availability as well. Um, so I think there's definitely, um, I think to Mike's earlier argument around small banks, raising the minimum for heightened standards from 50 billion to something much larger makes a ton of sense to relieve the burden on them. And so that dissemination of credit or services that they provide into a completely different segment of the market than the large banks is critical. But at the, at the top end of the, of the financial system, I, I just don't see it. I think you need to, uh, I think, you know, 90% of banks uh, basically said that their compliance costs had increased substantially as a result of Dodd-Frank. So I think what you really need more of is regulations need to look at the economic benefits and the cost. And that kind of rigorous analysis has to be done. What is the problem the regulation is trying to address? Does, does that regulation do it, or is there a less intrusive alternative to that regulation? And I think a lot of our regulations um, don't have that kind of rigorous uh, cost-benefit analysis. Neil, do you want to respond to that? Um, I guess a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, the amount of, I think there's broad agreement that uh, higher capital being held, especially by the biggest institutions, is a good idea. That's an amount of capital that dwarfs the compliance implementation costs. So um, I think just the idea that somehow the, the implementation of regulatory burden from Dodd-Frank X the capital. Um, has uh, been a meaningful contributor to, you know, uh, on average 2% GDP growth over the last eight years is not much sustained by the, by the data or by the literature on this topic. I mean, you did, for example, have an overwhelming deleveraging both in the household and in the commercial sector, which I think was probably a meaningful contributor. There's demography, there's all kinds of other things going on. And again, I just wanna, I know I keep saying this and I, uh, uh, I'm sure everyone's going to get a headache, but we know for sure that in the absence of all this, so I'm, I'm, I agree we should adjust what needs adjusting and Volcker's a good candidate, but in the absence of this, GDP was negative, you know, five, six percent, and the, the sort of catastrophic economic result of that just overwhelmingly dwarfs um, whatever's happening right now. So that's not an argument to say we shouldn't try to get it right and do um, some version of cost benefit or risk reward. Um, and for sure, the idea of, of imposing onerous reg regulations on the financial services sector that don't get you any meaningful benefit in terms of financial stability is a horrible idea. But I think we just need to be careful that we're, that the, you know, the pendulum has sort of swung. I, I started this with amnesia, that the pendulum has sort of swung back. We forget a little bit about what we all went through uh, eight, nine, ten years ago, and I think it's important not to do that because I think there should be, you know, I think there should be a fair look at, at rules and laws in this area, and we should carve back where it's not useful, but I think there should be a little bit of a burden that we should do so incrementally and carefully because the worst thing for everybody, for, for the financial sector, for the country as a whole, is if we go back to a place where we're not tending these issues adequately. We've been there. It was really pretty awful. Uh, Mike, you, you mentioned that uh, Hensarling might try to move some one-off components of a, of a, a reform bill, uh, if, given that you don't think it's likely it'll be able to move the whole thing at once. What, what do you think those components might be, and, and would it possibly meet what Neil described there, yeah, I incrementality? I don't think uh, Chairman Hensarling at this point is willing to show his cards as to what exactly those one-off components are going to be. His, his key focus at this point is going to be to move the, the Financial Choice Act through the House and try to put some pressure on the United States Senate to, to move as well. So I, I do think you know, one example of that could be potentially CFPB reform. And you know, I, I think one of the key things that I think we missed uh, when Dodd-Frank was done is we have more bank regulators today than we did when, when we started this process. And I tend to agree with you that the SEC and the CFTC, from a, from a regulatory perspective, that doesn't make any sense. But you add, layer on top of that the CFPB, 
Uh, and, and I think everybody's trying to figure out you know, what, the, what the regulatory environment should be uh, going forward. So I think Chairman Henserling is going gonna, is gonna to put forward a college try here and try to pressure the United States Senate to, to do something. And then he'll pivot to some more one-off pieces of legislation uh, and, and hopefully get some of those enacted. Um, but I, I do think you know, we need to view this through the very divisive political environment that we're living in right now. And I think for both sides of the aisle, uh, Dodd-Frank has become you know, a religion, uh, you know, one that has to be repealed, and for the other that you know, it can't be replaced or repaired uh, at any cost. So uh, I think it's going to be very difficult uh, to, get, to get any of those, those reforms through as a consequence of that divide. One final point. Um, that divide, I think, has also bled into these in so-called independent agencies. Mm -hmm. While they are still independent agencies, those agencies are changing. And I think one of the key things that uh, is, is, has changed them is the change of the Senate rules that you only have to get 51 votes to be confirmed as a commissioner at the SEC and the CFTC and all the rest of the alphabet soup of, of regulatory agencies. And that's a sea change, because you at least uh, had to get some members of the other party to vote to confirm these uh, independent uh, commissioners. Uh, and now it's just a 51 vote threshold and the majority party can force through really the most partisan nominees at, at most of at, at these agencies depending on who is in control. And I think that that could fundamentally change uh, the makeup of these of these independent agencies. And they also tend to be um, as a consequence of that, they, they tend to answer to the, the, their shepherds in the United States Senate rather than uh, the historic independence that they have had. And that's bad for the financial services system. It's bad for the country. Uh, and, and I think if there's some place that we can figure out a way to, to, to reaffirm the importance of bipartisanship with these independent agencies, I think it would go a long way. The good news is the new SEC chair declares himself an independent. That's right. <laughs> um, but in, in uh, response to some of the, the uh, complexity, um, we'll do a little test. How many people here, just raise your hands, have tried to take out either a home loan, a, you know, mortgage, a business loan, a car loan, get any kind of loan in the last, let's say, two years? Was it easy? <laughs> no, a lot of, kind, of, kind of mixed. Okay. So Ben Bernanke at one point got refused a mortgage, right. right? So you know, <laughs> multiply that by millions of people. What you hear from loan officers at banks is their time today is allocated very differently than their time ten years ago. So this is an individual loan officer saying that more than fifty percent of their time is allocated to check the box, fill out this form load this in this database, get this compliance check. They are spending an enormous amount of time just to make this, you know, some number of loans. It, it, it's enormous. So you, you, again, you sort of multiply that across all these different institutions, all these different <laughs> loan officers. Another example, because tangible examples help people understand. I met recently with somebody who happens to have been um, at a non-US bank, and they turned in a more than 30,000 page living will um, and other documentation to the Federal Reserve. Um, and they were told, thank you very much. Um, could you send us seven more physical copies? <laughs> Who's going to read that? Like, w w what, what is the point? So like eight people. <laughs> <laughs> very funny. So <laughs> you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica is, is a uh, museum piece today. Why, what are we doing? So why would we even need to create that lengthy a document and then certainly you know, back up the truck and deliver seven extra hard copies? Makes no sense whatsoever. This is where I say proportionality, whether you talk about it as cost benefit or what makes sense for a large institution versus a small institution, what things are germane to the problems that are actually happened. It's a lot of different ways to couch it, but there's no question in my mind when I hear things like that, 50% of their time, being spent on, you know, check the compliance box instead of doing what used to be their job of making loans or delivering, you know, 30,000 pages of stuff nobody's going to read or maybe eight people will read. I doubt it. Um, it just doesn't seem like we're, we're going down the right path. It, it's funny, though, because I think of, you know, uh, if loan officers are spending a lot more time on compliance than 10 years ago, I think about mortgage originations 10 years ago and, you know, the liar's loans and, right. you know, the... the 
direct fraud by mortgage brokers and right. such. So I guess, you know, the it, it, it certainly seems like they were not spending enough time on compliance 10 years ago. So how do you know 50% is wrong? What's the, what's the right amount of right. regulatory burden on these people? There's reasons for everything. I yeah. don't disagree. Um, and again, I'm not in the mortgage uh, origination yeah. business or anywhere in the mortgage chain. Um, but, you know, we had a, a situation where um, loan originators weren't regulated at all, right? Most of the mortgage bankers were independent. They weren't part of banks. They, they had no, no regulation. We've changed that, but we've made it to the point that, you know, individuals feel like they have to bring the truck with documents to even get a mortgage in many cases. And that's where I say proportional. There has to be some relook at this and say, what do we need to keep for safety and soundness? And what's just too much? Patrick, you said something in interesting before the panel, which was that, that, that you think that there are technological solutions to some of these things, that certain kinds of regulation could just be made easier through technology without actually having to make the rules simpler. Sure. Yeah. Well, and, and it's, it's maybe less around reduction of complexity, but certainly reduction of cost. And, and that's mm -hmm. why you're seeing an explosion of reg tech right now. It's probably one of the fastest growing segments of the fintech market. Um, you know, and, and AML is a perfect example. You know, the, and this is typically how the cycle works for financial institutions. We solve a crisis or an immediate problem with a whole bunch of manual intervention. There'll be a thousand people doing something. And then there will be commercial solutions, some of them third party, some of them proprietary, that get developed to automate a lot of that. And so now a lot of the AML simple AML processing is now done through you know simple rules based at a minimum but robotics and now and, and increasingly AI and that will substantially reduce the cost of what it started out as and that's the normal life cycle of how these things go now that won't solve all problems but um, you know technological solutions that are becoming commercial right now or are already commercial I think will reduce the, co the cost of a lot of what has already been implemented and so you don't need to repeal it to solve a cost problem um, in some cases these things Things will, will evolve through technology. Um, so uh, mo most of you are not actually at banks, and so I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about what, what you're seeing in terms of regulatory effects in, in your specific sectors and whether and maybe specific complaints that, that, that you have for your home industries. Um, uh, Mike, can I start with you? What do you yeah. yeah. Uh, so, for those of you who don't know what we do, uh, uh, I'm President and CEO of the American Investment Council, which is the largest association representing the private equity industry in the United States. Uh, we're a research advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. Uh, the AIC represents about 50% of assets under management uh, in the United States. So it's uh, most, of, most of the you know, largest private equity firms. Um, so some of the things that we're focused on, uh, first is the registration requirements that occurred under, under Dodd-Frank, the Financial Choice Act, uh, actually would eliminate uh, those registration requirements for private equity firms. Uh, this has been a very burdensome, burdensome requirement, particularly for those mid-market private equity firms uh, uh, to register. Um, so that's one of the key things that we're focused Describe on. Describe what re registration is, why it's costly. So you have to register with the SEC. Uh, it is a huge burdensome uh, uh, paperwork requirement for, uh, for a lot of firms that are not systemically risky. So uh, this is something venture capital was exempted from this requirement. Um, so we're uh, interested in, in being treated the same way that uh, our brethren in the venture capital community uh, mm -hmm. are under uh, the Dodd-Frank requirement. So from a regulatory perspective, uh, there was actually a, a bill that passed the, uh, in the United States House of Representatives in the last Congress that would eliminate some of these uh, paperwork requirements. Uh, that's probably a one-off approach that, uh, that, that we'll be working on uh, with Congress and the regulator uh, going forward this year. Barbara, what are you seeing for BlackRock? So we're an asset manager. Um, very simple is we manage other people's money. We may even manage a number of people's money in this room. And that means it's not our balance sheet. So <coughs> we don't have access to the Fed window. Uh, we don't have deposits. We don't have any taxpayer type liabilities. Um, and I think a big issue for us is to make sure we're not regulated as if we were a bank. Um, and that's been certainly part of the discussion over the last several years. I think that took a turn for the better in the last administration towards a products and activities approach, which we support. Um, but there's still some continuing work going on in that uh, regard internationally. Um, I also think there's a number of regulations outside of Dodd-Frank um, that certainly increase the reporting burden. Uh, we are a pretty technology-oriented company. It's probably going to be okay for us because we make that investment up front. Um, but most of the industry is complaining quite loudly that this is a huge burden, many of them either needing to outsource or find you know, some way of doing this. And again, it's just not proportional to the risks that are involved. 
and there's lots and lots of duplication within those different reports. I have a whole page. Unfortunately, I did slides, but you don't have a screen, so. We can, oh, I think, oh, I think we, we do. do, actually. Oh, if we could just yeah. go, oh, there's the screen. I'm sorry, I looked yeah. behind me. Yeah. Somebody have those slides? Any way of yeah. doing that? Just go, go forward real quick. There's only three slides in there. And anybody who wants these, we'll send them to you or make them available. The, uh, go, go back one. You went to three. Uh, other way. That's the third slide. <laughs> there. Okay. So this slide, um, Neil will probably like this slide. This is the slide that says <laughs> how we made the system. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Th this is the slide that says how we made the system safer. And there's all these rules on the left, um, not just U.S., but also, um, sorry, also Europe. And on the right, five categories of where we've really had an impact. And I'm sorry, Mike's going to be sad too, because I think that registration is a good idea, because we should know who to call if there's a question. And we didn't have that before at the SEC. So this is the, the sort of cataloging of what's been done. Now move ahead one. What does it actually look like and mean? Well, look at all those different new forms. How can that make any sense? Some of them reporting the same information slightly differently to slightly different people. I mean, it's just an absolute disaster. Uh, we could rationalize all of that, come up with a couple of forms, and use it globally. Maybe still report the information separately to five, ten different regulators around the world, but at least let's collect the same information in the same format, define the metrics the same way, um, and just be reporting them separately on different groups of funds. But instead, we have everybody's come up with their own ideas on what to report and how to report it, some of it even manual. So it makes no sense at all. And then the last one is, um, so there's lots of things we could do better, harmonization being right up there, um, and looking at the cumulative impact. Those are my three slides. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and Robert, what are, you, what are you finding with, you know, the, the sort of the relatively new model that SoFi has? So we're an online lender, and we've quickly, I think, become probably the largest at unsecured consumer loans and then added mortgage loans. I think for us, um, a, you know, two huge issues that came out of Dodd-Frank with a kind of a delayed reaction, the risk retention rules that um, ironically don't apply to qualified mortgages but apply to other asset classes that didn't cause the financial crisis. So um, that, and, and I think that, that the risk retention requirements imposed on, for example, we have AAA rated student loan refinance securitizations are definitely going to erode the ability to make loans in that area or, or be a negative in that area. Uh, ironically, the Volcker rule, which you'd say, well, why do we care about the Volcker rule? We're not a bank. Look at the definition of what a bank is, banking entity is under the Volcker rule. So we're actually interested in getting a bank charter, an industrial bank charter, and this has been public, but many um, uh, non-bank lenders, particularly ones backed by private equity by VCs, they're going to have a shareholder that owns a minority shareholder and a passive shareholder. But if you look at the Volcker rule, you run right into the definition of banking entity. And so the presumption that anyone with you know, more than 10% of a class of shares is, you know, controls a bank. And so that's an inhibition, I think, on the ability of newer model businesses to actually become a bank or get a bank charter. And then I'd say third, um, in the non-bank uh, lending area, there's a lot of issues right now. You have um, the OCC's proposed a SPNB, or Special Purpose National Bank Charter, which really provides, I guess, the, the disadvantages of a bank without the advantages, because you'd have, um, you'd, you would have preemption, so that's an advantage. But the way it's been written, essentially, you'd be uh, treated like a bank in every other aspect. You have bank capital requirements, um, liquidity requirements, and you'd have kind of the enhanced oversight um, as well. Now that, I think, ironically, has had a positive impact on states who are looking at uh, ways that, uh, to keep you know, uh, non-banks in the state-regulated system. So we, we had uh, actually, you know, the, the, the Department of Business Oversight in California had an ex extraordinary meeting with 16 leading fintech companies talking about how our ways the state regulation system could be better. Could there be passporting of licensing? In other words, could there be a way for non-banks to get the, the, you know, the, the same preemption treatment that banks get. So that's been salutary. So I think there's a lot of open issues um, you know, for uh, newer models that are not banks, but still regulated nonetheless. And so if you look at us, we're a covered person under Title 10 of Dodd-Frank, so we're supervised by the CFPB. We also have state regulators.
Patrick, you, you raised earlier a concern regarding the Vol Volcker rule and whether it's really pr discouraging risky activities or just moving them within the within the financial sector. Do you, is this a broad concern for you at a bank about you know that that you face regulations that other people can offer the same products without facing? It's it's not necessarily a concern for us per se. I think it's probably a broader concern systemically. You know, if okay. you look at the the increasing size, you know, if you look at kind of the largest end, certainly at the hedge fund sector, you look at the activities that are now migrating into the pension sector, um, activities that they wouldn't have previously been in, and regulated certainly in some ways but in a much different way and so uh, the risk really I think is that you know activity that you were trying to prevent because it's highly speculative in nature and has a l much larger amount of tail risk associated with it um, you know now just sits in a different pocket and you know some of these firms and you know I don't I certainly don't want to name any of them but certainly <laughs> at the very large end of the spectrum you know uh, not only would they propose fairly large risk in and of themselves but are very interconnected with the rest of the financial system mm -hmm. um, so I think that's where the real risk lies so I, I guess, Neil, listening to all of this, it's sort of, is there any way to tell before the next crisis happens whether we got all this stuff right, whether we impose these rules for good reasons? <laughs> well, I think it's, um, it's super hard to see uh, a cause of a crisis before it actually happens. I mean, I think uh, we're more attentive to things now, perhaps, than we had been uh, at the time this last crisis occurred. I think one of the things that we try to do in putting together a reformed regulatory framework is to create more cushion. Mm -hmm. That's the basic idea of capital, so that when things go wrong, which they do, um, there is more absorptive capacity in the system to deal with it. And then we try to create for the government more tools to deal with a range of potential scenarios that involve stress and instability. Um, uh, I think there were some things just by the way, that we haven't talked about that Dodd-Frank eliminated on the part of the government, mm -hmm. which I think um, are very dangerous. So the Fed had an emergency lending facility that was enormously important in the crisis. And Dodd-Frank changed that so that the Fed cannot provide those loans, which, after all, which by the way, had only be, could only be advanced for collateral. But now they can only be given for a whole category of institutions, not on an institution by institution basis. So it mm -hmm. constrains the government. And the FDIC's liquidity facility, which also is hugely important with respect to a whole lot of banks in stress in 08 and 09, now requires an act of Congress before it can actually be used. And so in those two ways, Todd Frank tied the government's hands in ways that when that moment of instability and stress happens, we're going to want the government to have those capabilities, to, to provide capital, to provide liquidity. Um, uh, it's, what, it's what, in the end, you know, saved the financial system from completely imploding in 08 and 09. So I think very hard to predict these things. I mean, you, you don't want to look for asset bubbles. You want to look for, you know, um, what's going on in particular asset classes. Um, I think uh, increasingly we are susceptible to, you know, uh, financial and geopolitical risk from outside of the U.S. That's a set of things to keep focused on. Um, and I think that the FSOC, which gets a lot of criticism in all kinds of different ways, from my perspective, one of the things we didn't have before the financial crisis was an effective forum for regulators to talk to one another, to share insights, to share perspectives, to come together especially on things that sit at the boundaries of their respective jurisdictions or that sit, you know, in overlapping spaces of their jurisdictions. And I think now we have an entity. It's not, it's to be sure imperfect. It's got a lot of, you know, uh, accountability and not that much authority. That's a bad mismatch. Um, but it at least is the beginning of a forum where all of the crazy quilt, you know, regulators that are the U.S. financial services regulators, and I think we all agree that that should be shrunk down in all kinds of ways, um, can come together and can share notes and do so reasonably effectively. It's got a long way to go, but I think that's a place where, if it works the way it ought to work, is a place where people can take note of early warning signs, things that are going on in the markets, and try to stay abreast of them. Is there, b besides merging the SEC with the CFTC, which it sounds like there are both good arguments for doing and well-known political reasons why it doesn't happen. Is there, are there other things that are a roadmap for how we could have less of a 
regulatory well, we, patchwork? We looked at yeah. this a ton in yeah. the government, and yeah. there's been a bunch of studies of this. But we have, you know, uh, we have, uh, we, by the way, OTS went away. So uh, on the point earlier, we added CFPB, we got rid of a bank regulator or a thrift regulator. <laughs> one in, one out. Um, whether that was an even trade, I don't know. You'll be the judge. Um, no. Uh, but in any event, um, we still have the Fed, the OCC, and the FDIC, all who have, you know, a range of bank regulatory functions. Some are safety and soundness. Some are, you know, uh, insurance related. Um, and there are all kinds of permutations, I think, None of them perfect to be sure, but where you could collapse three of them to two or maybe to one. Um, and, um, you know, again, the politics of that is overwhelmingly difficult, just Barbara, as a practical matter. Barbara, do you have a, a roadmap for how you do that? I don't have a roadmap for how I do that, but I would certainly start with the SEC, CFTC. That seems the obvious one. Um, it seems on the banking side, between the Federal Reserve regulatory <laughs> piece, the FDIC, the OCC, and now the CFPB. There's actually four, and you could have half, or maybe you could get four down to one, and have really one serious banking regulator with different functions. And I think that would clarify a lot of things for a lot of institutions. Again, we're not a bank, so we're not really dealing with all those different entities, uh, but it does look enormously complex, and it leads to things like the Volcker Rule, where everybody's got to put their piece in, mm -hmm. as opposed to looking at it as a whole. Okay, and, and that's just that's just the U.S. regulators, Josh. For, right. for global banks, you're, you know, certainly we have regular same same patchwork in Canada. You've got the FCA and the European regulators, who are maybe in some ways more aggressive, and CBRC in China and, and HKMA. It's it's never ending. So you can solve maybe some mic, some small part of the problem, but for the larger banks, it's. It's maybe it's not gonna it's not gonna make that much of a difference. Well, on on, on that happy note, um, that, is, <laughs> that is the end of our session. Thank you so much for joining us today.